So welcome to our ethics series. And you know, I'm Sister Miriam from Mission and Ministry and have the privilege of um, being with you every month for our ethics series to honor Zella Hall, who is the woman who actually started um, this series by donating to us um, a considerable amount of money to bring oh, in speakers on a monthly basis. You are ready to go hopefully under your own name. I think somebody. Sorry. You saw it. Teddy, uh, Billy was here, my dear. Registered under your own name will give you the advantage of getting CEUs for this program after you turn in your evaluation. So let us begin like we do all of our programs with prayer. If you bow your head. Blessed are you, God of all creation, whose very life permeates our world and whose goodness fills our hearts with you. Blessed are you who have brought us together as friends and colleagues. Be present to us, continue to work in us and one, the wonder of your grace, forming us as people committed to justice, mercy, healing, compassion, communication, and affirmation in a world burdened by this coronavirus, violence, injustice, and indifference. Pour forth your blessing upon us. We trust us for our mission as Vincent Charity Medical Center, as effective leaders and wise stewards of your bountiful gifts and compassionate caregivers. Bless the Zella Hall Ethics Series and all of our speakers who share with us their knowledge and their passion for what they are doing. Especially, we are grateful today to have a speaker to talk about those with behavioral health um, issues and how we can better help them during this difficult time. May this time strengthen the bonds that unite us and be faithful to each other. We pray this in God's name. Amen. So Dr. Perrin is our um, speaker for today. We are so delighted to have him. Um, our own doctor here at the hospital who does some compassionate and caring work every day with our patients and support to our staff. Dr. Perrin graduated with honors in history from Kenyon College and later graduated from Case Western Reserve School of Medicine. He is board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine, and his group provides medical doctorship services to um, several substance abuse treatment centers in Northeast Ohio. He is widely published and well-known speaker, both nationally and internationally. <clears throat> He established the Addiction Fellowship Program at Case Western Reserve School of Medicine in 1994 and co-directs the current Addiction Psychiatry Fellowship Program right here at St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. So without any more um, to, that I wanna offer, we think his greatest um, credentials for this speech today is who he is and how he lives and the passion that he brings to his job. Dr. Perrin, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Sister Miriam and Sister Jane. It certainly is my absolute pleasure to be able to be here to speak with you all today as part of the Zella Hall lecture uh, series. I'm going to take a huge leap into the great world of technology, something that is not my area of strength, um, and try to figure out how to share a PowerPoint with you all. Let's see. Share screen. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hang on. I am making a wave to the bullpen for some advice. Hmm. Ah. 
That's why it's always good to have a bullpen. <laughs> Okay, so I'm, I'm talking about addressing substance use disorder treatment uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this really has been a very real life challenge to all of us over the last six, seven months. Um, I would make a request for anyone who has dialed in to be sure to mute yourself. Uh, it decreases the amount of effort that takes place, the additional conversations that uh, drift in and out of the presentation. Um, Pandemic-informed substance use disorder treatment. Uh, the learning objectives that we want to try to focus on today include um, examining the current substance abuse trends, especially regarding the pandemic, comparing and contrasting pandemic best practices with uh, pre and hopefully soon post-pandemic best practices for add addiction treatment. And then strategies to try to prevent substance abuse um, during this during this pandemic time. So let me briefly talk a little bit about the pandemic, what it is, where we are now, and the implications for substance use disorder treatment providers. And this pandemic being a novel coronavirus and being a virus that we are all susceptible to um, is a very scary time for all of us, uh, for our nation and for the world. Um, when these uh, novel viruses come out, uh, it can be very unpredictable. And we as human beings are always asking for answers and we're always asking for reassurance. And every time that I watch the evening news or I watch a news um, a conference with an infectious disease or a public health expert, I always hear earnest and fervent questions from all of us, our communities. And they often are the questions that we don't have good answers for yet. Um, how dangerous is it? When is it going to go away? Um, uh, how can we protect ourselves and still keep our lives going, keep our communities going? Um, all of those are wonderful questions, but they're really questions that we don't have good answers for. What we do know is that uh, this virus, when it reaches a certain level in any community, uh, can begin to spread in a way that isn't just person to person, but begins to spread in a way that's geometric. Um, so that one person who has it, um, if we're not very, very careful, can infect another 3.7 people. And then those 3.7 who have it will infect another 3.7 each. And that's how this, this virus can explode so quickly. And that's why what we're forced with now, where we are now, um, is doing our best from a public health standpoint to keep the, slow, the, the spread as low as possible while we wait in hopefully patient and expectant hope uh, for, a, um, for an intervention where we can not only effectively treat people who have the virus so that the fatality rate goes down, and I think we've made huge progress with that, and also soon um, wait for the vaccine. I think the vaccine information is very real. It's honest, it's effective, um, at least the ones that we know about so far. And once they're available, I as a healthcare provider and as a person in Northeast Ohio will encourage all of my colleagues, friends, family to take the vaccine. I know that some people are hesitant about it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is not a time to be hesitant about a vaccine. Uh, this is a time to follow the science. And when the scientists and the uh, CDC and the National Inst Institute of Health tell us that a vaccine is available and safe, um, our honestly next question to protect ourselves and to protect hey, our they come one by one, I can think. Where can we find it? Uh, and how soon can I get it? And so that's, I think, where we are now. The other place where we are now, and this is a transition into talking about substance abuse treatment, is we're at a place right now where there's a lot of virus in the community, but we also have some pretty good ideas on how to limit its spread. Maintaining physical distance. I think the whole idea of social distance was a bad term. It was a, it was a selection of the wrong term. We need physical distancing. Social distancing means you socially separate yourself from significant others. That's not necessarily um, 
the thing to do. I'm sorry. All right, so let's see how not, how it works now. Um, so I think the whole idea of, um, of social distancing is the wrong concept. The concept we're interested in is physical distancing, being six feet apart, wearing masks, wearing masks, wearing masks, and if I forgot to mention it, wearing masks. Um, it's absolutely essential. The reason why we were recommended not to wear masks in the beginning of the pandemic is because there weren't enough masks in the nation. And the masks that we had needed to be used in emergency rooms and intensive care units. Now we have plenty of masks. Everyone should wear a mask. So physical distancing, wearing masks, frequent hand washing. Um, and frequent sanitizing areas where we're together and limiting the numbers of people we have contact with is really where we're at now. This has created a huge challenge to people who um, provide substance abuse treatment services, a huge challenge. Um, because the essence of substance abuse treatment is getting together with other people. The nature of addictive disease is to isolate people with addiction from significant others. Just think about it. If a person develops addiction, they start to behave in bizarre, scary, and unpredictable ways. Their family begins to retreat. Their friends begin to retreat. They often lose a job. They sometimes lose their home. Addiction is an isolating disease. The essential nature of addiction is to isolate people from meaningful interpersonal relationships and meaningful relationships with oneself and one's higher power, God as we know it. That's the nature of addiction. And then the virus comes on top of it and forces to people to be even more separate. And it intensifies uh, the disaster and the devastation of addictive disease. So this isolation piece of trying to decrease the spread of COVID-19 has played right into the basic essential nature of addictive disease and made it worse. So how can we ethically, and this is, this, I mean, this whole series really focuses on the complex interaction between healthcare, people's lives and ethics. How can we ethically move forward in order to try to provide the best treatment possible for people who are suffering from addiction, yet at the same time be reasonable stewards of the public health in our community vis-a-vis -vis the virus spreading. I think the way to do it is to think about risks and benefits. And risks and benefits really are applied ethics. It really is saying, what is the risk of the virus to patients with addiction, people with addictive disease? And the answer is it's different depending on which patient it is. If you have a 30-year-old person with a cocaine problem, a heroin problem, or an alcohol problem with no coexisting medical issues, the risk to them of the virus in terms of dying from COVID-19 is very small. 
On the other hand, if you have a 65 year old person with alcoholism and emphysema because they've been smoking for 40 years, the risk to that person if they catch the virus is huge in terms of dying. So you need, so a, a, a treatment provider that's interested in providing COVID informed care, COVID-19 pandemic informed care, which is what we are doing at Rosary Hall and what we have been doing since the beginning of the pandemic. The challenge to treatment providers when it comes to patients is to individually assess each patient in terms of their risk from addiction dying and their risk from the virus if they were to catch it. And patients where their risk from addiction dying is very high, people with alcohol and opiate problems, if they don't have a lot of comorbidities, it's safe to invite those people if they're comfortable to come to in-person treatment because in-person treatment is several orders of magnitude more therapeutic than Zoom treatment for addictive disease, especially in those critical first six weeks to six months. Alcoholic Anonymous in its wisdom since 1935 has known that 60% of relapses take place in the first three months and 80% of relapses take place in the first six months. So whatever we do to try to help people stay sober, whatever we know to be effective, we need to double down on that in the first three to six months. Once a person's six months sober, Zoom meetings, calling your sponsor, texting your sponsor, staying in your little pod in your home environment is pretty safe and pretty helpful for sobriety. But when a person's in those first tender three to six months of sobriety, they do best if it's safe for them to be around other people. So the first question is, what's the risk of the virus to our patients? The second question, because honestly, Addiction treatment does not happen in a vacuum. What's the risk to our staff? We have an ethical obligation to our staff. What's the risk to our staff to provide treatment in person compared to providing virtual treatment by Zoom? And it's different depending on different staff members. If we have a staff member who may weigh 40 or 50 pounds more than they should, who has obstructive sleep apnea and is 68 years old, that staff member needs to provide addiction services or treatment on Zoom. They need to stay home and provide the services over the ethers that we're so used to nowadays. On the other hand, if you have a staff member who's 50 years old, who exercises vigorously, no lung problems at all, and, and, whose, and whose weight is within a reasonable range, that staff member, if they're willing, because this should be an issue of volunteering, asking people if they're willing to volunteer, if they're willing, that person is probably safe enough to provide treatment in person and to come to the hospital, to Rosary Hall in order to offer group therapy for patients. The third question is what risk of the addiction to the patient? Remember, the first question is what's the risk of the virus to the patient? And what's the risk of the virus to the staff? then what's the risk of addiction to the patient? An opiate addiction, accidental fatal overdose on opiates is the number one cause of accidental death in the U.S. right now. We have lost 250,000 Americans to COVID-19. But in this year, we've lost 65,000 to accidental fatal overdose on opiates. Now you say, well, 250 versus 65, it sounds like COVID's more fatal than opiate addiction. It's actually not true. There's only about 3 million Americans with opiate addiction and 65,000 have died. We've had over 10 million Americans moving towards 12 million Americans infected by COVID and 250,000 have died. Opiate addiction is as fatal as COVID, if not more so. And we know that people who if they catch COVID, tend to die, are older, heavier, with lung problems, diabetes, and heart disease. So if you have a younger person who's not heavier, who doesn't have lung problems, doesn't have diabetes, and doesn't have heart disease, the risk to that person of their opiate addiction is much higher than the risk of COVID in terms of killing them in the next year. So those people are safe enough to come to treatment. 
And as I said, some other patients are not safe enough to come to treatment and the risk isn't as high. So people with alcohol problems and opiate problems are at the highest risk of dying from addiction in the next year. Those are the two most fatal addictions in the next year. People with marijuana problems probably have 0% chance of dying in the next year from their marijuana addiction. It's a devastating addiction, but it doesn't tend to kill people. Although they do tend to eat everything in the refrigerator. Um, and so those people you might wanna keep in virtual Zoom kind of treatment. But people with alcohol and opiate problems, if humanly possible, it's important to keep treatment open. And then finally, um, what are the risks of addiction to the staff? And the risk of addiction to the staff is zero. I mean, the staff aren't the ones with addiction. The risk of addiction is to the patients. And so if you look at that risk benefit ratio, we come up with the following um, sort of approach to um, advance my slides here. There we go. Uh, the following approach. Substance abuse, substance, substance abuse treatment during COVID-19 is less risky and more beneficial for many populations. But providing in-person treatment is more risky for staff. And so it's an ethical obligation of any employer in any treatment program that, you know, considers its staff an invaluable resource. Um, it's important to, to differentiate which staff members are under which risk and which staff members are probably safe enough to invite to come back to work. So the implications for treatment providers are to figure out which staff can work in patient in person care and which staff members have to stay in virtual care. And the implications for the patients are um, try to get them in-person care in the first three to six months of treatment and then try to treat them virtually after that. We have high retention rates. I mean, anyone who runs an intensive outpatient program on Zoom makes money because everyone shows up for the Zoom groups. But the relapse rate is horrendously high. You get high treatment retention but the efficacy of the treatment is not very good. Early and sometimes later relapses really abound. So how can we minimize the COVID-19 risks? Well, first of all, detox is necessary. Detox is a life-saving intervention. Well, patients can't detox themselves. If patients could detox themselves, they wouldn't have addiction. So detox is absolutely necessary and all legitimate detox units have stayed open during the entire COVID-19 epidemic. The, the emergence of virtual treatment for aftercare, ongoing individual therapy, mental health counseling is wonderful. But modified in-person treatment for that initial, as I have said so many times already, three months or so is really essential. But it needs to be modified in a way that you, um, that you address safety concerns, uh, convenience, um, uh, that you can provide it to people, and that it's efficacious. So what we've learned about virtual treatment is this. Virtual treatment is the safest approach to treatment for the staff because you're not interacting with patients uh, in a personal way and at risk of being infected. And it's also the safest for very high-risk patients, patients with severe diabetes, emphysema, heart disease, elderly, overweight, or obstructive sleep apnea. That's, those are the groups that are at high risk. Virtual treatment is very efficacious for mental health patients, for individual counseling, for depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. Um, Zoom meetings are extremely useful. And, and virtual treatment is necessary during a full lockdown, but we're no longer in a full lockdown. And so modified in-person treatment is best for most patients with substance use disorders, those who are not at high risk, especially those in the first three months. And the initial outpatient treatment is beginning to look like it should be intensive outpatient, IOP, three hours a day for as many days a week as you can possibly offer it. Offering PHP, partial hospital care, for five to six hours a day 
in person together is very difficult to do in a safe way during COVID. PHP requires too much togetherness for a too long a period of time during the day when people are all together, whereas IOP for three hours. And so, so the, let, me, let me cut to the chase here in terms of my clear recommendations for substance abuse treatment providers at this point during COVID. If you don't hear anything else uh, during the rest of the talk, um, you have to bend over backwards to make sure it's as safe as possible. And I'll go through those things in a minute, but we should be offering IOP, intensive outpatient, and if typically your IOP was three days a week and your PHP was five days a week, during COVID offer IOP five days a week. Try to offer IOP every day. If you used to offer IOP four days a week, more intensive IOP, during COVID try to offer it six days a week. I know that requires people coming in on that holiday of all holidays in America, Saturday. Um, but you know, we need to step up. And if we can't offer PHP because it's too much togetherness, too much time together physically in the same environment, we should offer IOP as many days a week as humanly possible during COVID. And then once COVID is passed and we've been vaccinated and hopefully we come out the other side healthy and holy, um, once it's over, then we can go back to our regular schedules of PHP, IOP, et cetera. But we need to make IOP more intensive than it ever has been because it has to substitute for a, a level of care, PHP, which is difficult to conceive of being safe uh, during COVID-19. Now, anybody who wants to, you can go grab lunch, walk the dog, do whatever you want. You've heard the bottom line. Um, so let me talk about modified in-person treatment or what is emerging in the literature now as COVID-informed treatment. So it means offering IOP treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, three hours a day, at least three days a week, but preferably four, five, or six days a week. So it means offering IOP treatment, but it requires screening so that very high-risk people aren't coming into group. And so that requires a temperature screen, a symptom screen, and asking people if they have a close contact who's been diagnosed with COVID recently. If people have had a close contact, they need to step back to virtual IOP treatment and not in-person IOP treatment. If a person has symptoms that could be related to COVID, they need to step back to virtual IOP treatment, not in-person. And if a person has a temperature above 100.4, uh, degrees, they need to step back to virtual IOP treatment for 10 to 14 days, not in person. So you need good screening at the beginning before people come each day to IOP, consistent, reproducible, thorough screening. The second thing we need is distancing. The numbers of people who can fit in a counseling room when we used to have 12 is now more like five or six um, because you need enough space in between people given that they're going to be in that room together for a while you need enough space in between people so you need physical distancing again social distancing is a misnomer we need to talk about physical distancing in america social distancing causes relapses because it's isolating we need physical distancing but social relating number three we need masks we need masks, we need masks, we need masks. If a counselor is using a room some of the time as their office and some of the time as a group therapy room, that counselor is professionally obligated to wear a mask in that room at all times. Because if you only wear your mask during group and then you take your mask off when all the patients leave and you cough and sneeze all over the room, without a mask on, um, and you happen to be an asymptomatic carrier, or as we know from COVID-19 now, the 36 hours before a person gets symptoms, they're at substantial infectivity. That's why this disease is spread so much, is because people for 36 hours before they ever have a clue that they're sick, they can be effectively spreading the virus in their environment. So if if you're using a, a room for an office and for a group room, 
then the reality is when you get out of your car in the morning and you come in the hospital, you put on your mask when you come in the hospital and you keep your mask on in your office, even when patients aren't there, because you're gonna share that space with patients in group therapy later on in the day. And then sanitizing and hand washing. So hand washing, of course, but everyone should sanitize or hand wash their hands before they come to group and everyone should do it immediately after, as they leave group. It should be, you know, when, with a with an AA meeting, you know, the way AA meetings start off with the traditions and the steps, and then they finish with the Lord's Prayer. All group sessions should start with hand sanitizing and should end with hand sanitizing as people leave. The duration of exposure should be kept as limited as possible, but still effective, which means IOP rather than PHP, but more days of the week in IOP. And as I said, the frequency of treatment should move towards five or even six days a week. And lastly is cleaning the environment. There are sprays and stuff that you can come through and spray in the evening and things will be, will be sanitized in the morning. Um, that kind of thing has to be done uh, every day in treatment programs. Um, and every time a group ends and people leave, someone should come through that room with wipes and go over the hands of the chairs the seats of the chairs, the backs of the chairs, and any flat surfaces in the room should be wiped with a wipe every time a group leaves. It, it requires a tremendous amount of effort, but that's the effort that's necessary in order to provide safety. So where do the risks from COVID come from? Well, they come from patients and they come from staff and they come from our families, the people we live with, the people in our homes. Um, that's where the COVID risks come from. They come from other people. I mean, they really don't catch COVID from a golden retriever. A good thing, because good luck putting a mask on a golden retriever, and they just lick you all over the place uh, when they see you come home from work. Um, we get it from patients. If there's a risk from patients, there's a risk from staff, and there's a risk from the people who are in our environments outside of our, of our work space. And that's why it's so important to do screening. And, and to ask people, you know, from a from a professionalism standpoint, a commitment to each other to answer honestly when we're screened. There've been some special challenges with, uh, with COVID-19 with some different kinds of treatment programs. So methadone programs. Methadone programs, part of our treatment armamentarium for opiate addiction. We have uh, three methadone programs in, in, in uh, Cuyahoga County right now, one at the VA and then two uh, community methadone programs. They are required by law to have every one of their patients come every day and drink their dose of methadone and then speak to the nurse before they leave. They're not even allowed to give them methadone to go unless they've received so-called take-home doses uh, because they're stable. But before they're stable, people have to come every day, six days a week, they're allowed to take one dose home on Saturday and drink on Sunday, um, 52 weeks a year. And then they go and interact with the rest of the world and then come back to the methadone program. So that's been a real challenge in the methadone programs. And at most methadone programs, you see a lot of people waiting outside these days in their cars or spaced six feet apart down the, down the street with the weather starting to change and come in in terms of winter now. Um, because they only let a certain number of people in the facility at a time so that they can be spaced six feet apart and so that there's no congregating. Um, everyone required to wear a mask, everybody with a temperature check before they step foot inside the methadone program. And then what happens when a patient on a methadone program gets COVID and is sick and is short of breath if they walk, you know, half a block and really is short of breath if they get in the car and drive to the program? Now what do you do? What if they're still using opiates or using cocaine, but they have COVID? Do you give them take-home doses of methadone, which if they take too much of it, they could die of an accidental fatal overdose? Do you require them to still come in? Most methadone programs have switched. So anybody who's COVID positive, who's unsafe to give take-home doses to, most methadone programs now dose them at the curb. The patients who are COVID positive, pull in in your car, a staff member gets gowned up, comes out, brings the medicine to them at the curb. They watch the patient consume the medicine at the curb and then staff member goes back in. So there have been, it's required a tremendous amount of resiliency and problem solving in medical programs. Um, same thing with buprenorphine providers. Uh, buprenorphine is, you know, has a, has a requirement 
um, uh, in the past a federal requirement of face-to-face -face care in order to start a patient on buprenorphine. But what if the patient has COVID and you can't really do face-to-face -face care? Um, uh, the challenges have been uh, tremendous. Uh, most of us buprenorphine providers um, in our buprenorphine clinics, including our buprenorphine clinic here at the HCC at St. Vincent Charity, um, we uh, have given refills on the buprenorphine to as many patients as we can. We're doing virtual visits for as many patients as we can. And only those patients who are unstable right in the beginning of buprenorphine do we actually have come in. Uh, and, and, and the challenges of doing tox testing over, over Zoom. Can you imagine trying to check somebody's tox screen over Zoom? It's, it's sort of an oxymoron. Um, so you ask people, you know, how are you doing? And they say, good. Now, usually in addiction treatment, we may all live in Northeast Ohio, but in addiction treatment, we act like we're from Missouri, right? You know, Northeast Ohio may be the heart of it all, but Missouri is the show me state. So in addiction treatment, we don't say, tell me how you're doing. We say, show me how you're doing. Show me the sign slips from your AA meeting. Show me the phone number and the first name of your sponsor so I can call them. Show me your normal tox screen. And during this virtual time of, of a lot of follow-up, we've had to go to a lot more, just tell me. And I fervently hope you're telling me the truth. So those have been some of the additional uh, challenges uh, that we've seen um, during COVID. Additional challenges in substance abuse treatment. Um, naloxone distribution. As everybody knows, distributing Narcan or naloxone to the community substantially decreases fatal overdoses. Because if people with addiction or their loved ones have Narcan kits, and if there's an overdose, they're able to treat a person while they call 911. And you keep people alive, you avoid brain damage, um, uh, and you avoid all these people on long-term ventilators with sort of terrible brain damage from an overdose, but you saved them soon enough so their heart didn't stop beating. Um, so it, it's a tremendous harm reduction intervention. But during the lockdown, all of the, all of the naloxone vans in Cuyahoga County then go out and distribute naloxone and also distribute, um, exchange uh, clean needles for used needles, which decreases hepatitis C and HIV in our community. All those vans had to be closed down. Now that we moved out of lockdown, those have, have, have restarted again. All of our prevention education, all of our HIV and hep C prevention education, which is so useful face-to-face. -face. You, can, you can teach a person how to avoid HIV and hep C, even if they've chosen to keep using IV drugs. And at the same time, you can plant a seed about treatment. You know, there is a better way. You deserve better. None of God's children deserve to have to be out here trying to figure out how they're going to get heroin twice a day, not knowing how much fentanyl is in it, not knowing if they'll have an overdose. But as long as you're using, I want you to be able to not get HIV and not get hep C and not spread it to other people. But you do deserve better. Someday you will get better. I want you to know that. So planting those seeds of treatment while you're providing harm reduction is only effective face-to-face. Um, and having to do that over people's cell phones and stuff is a good effort and a valiant attempt, but it loses much of its efficacy. So this loss of face-to-face -face programming during the surges, during, the, during COVID surges can be really problematic. Um, and we talk about our frontline workers and our frontline workers who are working in the grocery store and you know working in the gas station and working in the ERs and working in the hospitals and working in our IOP programs. But our frontline workers are also driving these vans in the community um, and trying to, prevent, trying to distribute harm reduction uh, interventions to keep our future patients as healthy as possible now so that when we do see them and they've decided to make a change in their life, um, uh, they are healthier uh, and they have a better shot at being able to stay sober. So let me uh, finish with this, and then hopefully um, you all have been able to type in some things in the chat box or the question and answer box or whatever boxes are out there in this weird world we live in. Um, uh, virtual treatment, you get very high registration rates and you get very high attendance rates. 
treatment programs in Northeast Ohio that averaged only five out of 12 patients showing up for IOP on any given day have typically had 10 to 12 out of 12 patients showing up for Zoom IOP. But most of the patients were on the phone and didn't turn on their cameras. So, you know, if a patient doesn't have their camera on and you're trying to do IOP, it is a very watered down uh, sort of experience. So you get high registration rates, you get high attendance rates. If you can get video and audio, it's much better than audio only if you're doing virtual treatment. However, think about our patient population here on the Near East side of Cleveland. This is a high speed internet desert. And so up to 80% of African American people in the US who are in lower socioeconomic stratus do not have high speed internet available to them. The only internet they have available to them is through their cell phone. And they have to be sophisticated enough. They have to have, what did I hear it called? It was called, um, uh, well, internet um, sophistication. They have to be sophisticated enough to be able to download the app onto their phone and then use it in order to do anything other than to call into their IOP program. And so, again, um, the least among us are so often the people who are hit so heavily by every new thing that comes to our communities. And that's why, you know, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ told us, what you have done for the least among us is what you have done for me. And that's why it's so important for all of us working in addictions treatment to try to do, to try to think outside the box as much as possible to help our patients in any way we possibly can during this very difficult time. Mercifully, the federal government has stepped in from a healthcare standpoint and permitted payment for all of this virtual treatment. Whereas before the COVID epidemic, you really couldn't get paid for a lot of this video and virtual and audio treatment. It's unclear whether that'll continue to be available after COVID is done, but I think it probably will. I think the world has changed in COVID. And I think that face-to-face -face initial treatment will still be absolutely essential, but virtual monitoring and treatment down the road to continue to support people, I think will have a bigger and bigger role in addiction treatment and mental health treatment and primary care treatment um, uh, for, for the future. So in summary, during the lockdown, there were horrendous implications for substance abuse treatment. We still had detox, but everything else went virtual and there were much poorer outcomes. There was much better show up. People signed up and they showed up virtually, but the efficacy of the treatment is much weaker during lockdowns. Post lockdown, we need to keep our high risk staff continuing to do virtual treatment because it's ethically inappropriate to ask a staff member who, if they do come down with COVID has a high risk of dying to come into treatment, to come in and give in-person treatment to patients. We need to take our high-risk patients and keep them in virtual treatment. Because even though face-to-face -face treatment is more efficacious, if you've got an elderly patient with emphysema and addiction, it's best for them to stick in the virtual world. And our lower-risk staff and our lower-risk patients, when it's not a lockdown, can come in and, pro and work together providing COVID-informed treatment. And COVID-informed treatment is intensive outpatient rather than partial hospital program. But five to seven days a week of IOP, not three. Spacing people in group so you don't really have more than six or at most seven people in group, although technically you're allowed to have 12 and bill for 12, sorry. Unless you've got an arena to have 12 people in. Um, in order to do spacing, you have to limit the size of your groups. You need to sanitize on the way in, sanitize on the way out. Make sure any room that's used for a group room, whenever a staff member's in it, they have a mask on because you don't want them to infect the room when no patients are around so they don't wear their mask and then have patients come into an infected room. 
and I think we need to clean every night. And every time a group is over, have somebody come through and wipe the obvious surfaces in the room. Good air movement, trying to keep windows open or at least uh, high airflow uh, also makes a substantial difference. So uh, at this point, I'm absolutely available for questions and I won't guarantee answers because this is new for all of us. We are all learning as we go forward. Uh, with this COVID-19, none of us have lived through this. Our grandparents lived through the 1918 influenza, but none of us really have lived through this. Um, and so I'll take a swing at answers, but certainly the questions are, are, are welcome. Someone did actually send in a question before we started, and so let me start with that one. And then if things come up on chat or whatever, the staff here can probably help me with it. Um, so, um, uh, so here is, uh, my question for tomorrow's Zelda Hall is, the AA model has been in place since 1935 for 85 years. Are there any new models of outpatient treatment for addiction that should be considered versus the 12-step model? There are no new models that should be considered versus the 12-step model of recovery. But there are many models which are extremely useful in addition to the 12-step model of recovery. Why does the 12-step model of recovery maintain its efficacy over all, over all these years? Remember what I said right at the beginning, if you could hear me. I know we had some audio issues at the beginning, but what I said at the right, right at the beginning, if you didn't, didn't hear me or if you forgot, is by definition, addictive disease is an isolating event. Addiction is the only biologic, partially genetic, partially environmental brain disease, which relentlessly strips patients of their self-image and self-respect, their hope, their close loved ones, their social relationships in the community, their work or school, and eventually their health. It's the only disease that does that. And therefore the antidote to this isolating disease is getting together with other people who deeply care about you, even though they don't know anything about you except that they share this disease with you. And that's called an AA meeting. And that's why AA meetings are so therapeutic. It, it fills that hole in your soul that aches if you have addiction. It fills that hole in your soul that aches with a with the sustenance of a meaningful interpersonal relationship that's anonymous. So it doesn't come with a lot of strings attached, just caring about you as one of God's children. And that's why AA is so potent. But there's lots of other things that are potent too that should be added to it. Cognitive behavioral therapy is extremely useful. Medications are partially useful. Um, environmental interventions, getting people into recovery houses, sober houses, residential care, detox units. So environmental interventions are extremely helpful too. Family counseling is extremely helpful. I almost said family therapy and I caught myself. People with addiction have no business being in family therapy until they've been sober for a year. Family therapy stirs up a lot of issues in the family that are person in early sobriety is not ready to deal with. Family counseling is critical. And then family therapy after a year. So there's lots of models that are coming out now. Motivational interviewing is a great model. Rather than confrontative, in your face, you're in denial, blah, 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 sort of, sort of shame and humiliation, which used to be done in treatment programs, has been replaced by motivational interviewing, which is extremely efficacious. So it's not really things versus the AA or the 12-step model, it's things in addition to the 12-step model. So another question, um, I believe you can require video participation by way of Zoom. However, some phones do not have subscriptions with enough memory to support the Zoom app. It's absolutely true. That's a real specific example of the fact that the have-nots in our society tend to overwhelmingly suffer when there's suffering going around. Uh, and it's a technologic suffering, but it's a suffering. If you don't have high speed internet in your home, and if your cell phone doesn't have enough memory in order to download the Zoom map, 
uh, the Zoom app. Um, my, my, my children had to tell me what an app was. You know, I'm, all, I'm an old person trying to learn this. Stuff. Um, uh, or, if, or if you don't have enough, um, uh, don't have enough on your internet plan in order to, in order to involve a lot of data, um, then you're really just stuck talking on the phone with the group, which is way better than nothing, but only marginally better than nothing. Everything above that is even better, and it's not available to some of our more disadvantaged patient populations. And then let's see, there's one more. Um, did we attempt outdoor IOP when the weather was warmer? Do you think it would help to improve participation? Um, we had a wonderful outdoor health fair here at St. Vincent Charity uh, Medical Center. It was wonderful. And it just happened to be that Friday before Halloween um, when it was like 78 degrees and sunny. It was gorgeous. It was perfect. Um, now we do live in Northeast Ohio and it is November. So the sun is going to get ready to go away and it's not going to come back till April. Um, and uh, we'll have other celestial events in the sky, but it won't be the sun. And it's going to be cold and it's going to be kind of crummy. Um, so the outdoor things are a great idea. But I think now, for people who run treatment programs, it is way past time to be creatively strategizing about what open spaces within our facilities might possibly be retrofitted. And I mean even like basement elevator lobbies where people tend not to go through much can possibly be outfitted to run a group therapy session so that there's enough space enough dis physical distancing remember we're not social distancing with physical distance we're about physical distancing um, uh, so that so that we can continue to do our, our treatment of people um, when the weather turns on us but several programs did a lot of outdoor activities um, uh, uh, during the good weather and let's see, is the naloxone we have by way of the grant being distributed effectively at this time? So several grants have come through recently to try to make naloxone available to the community. Unfortunately, um, grants are well-meaning, but they often come with language. And often the language of the grant, which seemed to make sense to the people who were giving the grant, wind up handcuffing treatment providers. And that's what's happened regarding naloxone or Narcan uh, in Ohio. Uh, the grant that was put out by the state, um, signed off by the pharmacy board, uh, said that individual counseling had to be done by a pharmacist to a patient who receives naloxone. And pharmacists are busy people. Um, uh, just ask Sister Judith Ann. Um, and if every <laughs> and if every patient who receives a Narcan kit has to have a 15 or 20 minute or even five minute individual counseling session by an outpatient pharmacist, you're going to markedly decrease the odds that anybody gets Narcan. Now, fortunately, that rule has been amended. And now a pharmacist can train another staff member, a pharmacy tech, a counselor, a nurse, people who are counseling patients anyway, whose job it is to counsel patients um, and who, who are not just in a pharmacy, but out in the treatment community. And so we're in the process now of uh, getting staff members trained to be able to do the counseling um, so that every patient with, an, with a history of or current opiate addiction who passes through St. Vincent Charity Medical Center is provided an naloxone kit. And I think we're making tremendous progress. Uh, way more distribution now than in the previous six months. And I think there'll be several orders of magnitude more distribution in the next few weeks to a month or so than we have even up to this point. And let's see, I think, I think that's uh, the extent of our questions and we're really pretty much